I am David Degnan. I am a biological data scientist here at PNNL. I have a really fun background in biology, computer science, chemistry, and statistics. So in my job, I get to work with the data from the second it comes off the instrument, through the identification, through the quality control, through the statistics, through the machine learning to take it all the way back to the biology that's uh, really close to my heart. So that's why they asked me to give you today's tour. Like every good tour, we're gonna lay some ground rules, but instead of keeping your hands and arms inside the vehicle, I'm gonna to explain to you which tools I've picked to highlight today and why. Um, first, I'd like to cover, we're not gonna get every tool every, ever made ever. It's going to be way too long. <laughs> so I'm gonna focus specifically on a group of tools that I'm considering in our bulk omics pipeline, which I will get to in a moment uh, to kind of clarify what I mean there. Um, there's also nuanced variability when it comes to these tools, when you use them, when people don't use them. So we're going to try to do this uh, high level first, and then I'll get into each of these tools and more details as I go along. Um, no tool is a one size fit all for your analysis, but um, all tools that I'm presenting today are under active and continued development. So you'll see pictures of people underneath it and contact information for each of these people. So if you're interested in learning more about the tools, we can point you to someone who's actively working on. So um, that's the tools I've chosen to highlight. Um, and I've also tried to credit all of the staff. There is a small 6,000 people that work at PNNL right now. So I didn't put all of their pictures up there, but I've tried to include at least the people that I know are actively working on it. But I do apologize to all my wonderful colleagues if you are missed. Um, I love you. All right. So. Let's get started. Um, when I'm talking about omics in general, uh, I'm going to be referring to MS and NMR based omics. We do have um, a few tools that incorporate transcriptomics data, but if you're familiar with EMSL, we tend to focus on MS, so mass spectrometry, and NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance based um, technologies. And so when I'm talking about bulk MS omics, I'm talking about when we take the traditional data types for each of these, which is you've got your sample, whether it's a soil or um, some bit of a, a tissue and you run it through the identification forward. What I'm not referring to is these ones. So uh, developing technology here is we're trying to get both, all of our mass spec omics on the single cell level. So we've got uh, micropots and nanopots technologies, which you can talk to Dusan or Maria if you wanna know more about those. And I think Maria gave us uh, a bit of a snapshot of where that um, is going. And so they're interested there in getting to the single cell level for each of these uh, omics, which is very useful for our soil data and our uh, microbiology samples. Um, I can say that at this point, I think we're to like hundreds of cells, depending on the cell size, but we're not quite there at the single cell level. So we don't have a lot of tools to analyze it yet because the technology is not there, but it is a burgeoning and fun technology as well as um, any of the meta technologies, the meta transcromics. I've seen lots of your uh, applications and everyone was talking about meta transcromics, meta metabolomics. You're just throwing meta on all the other omics. And so those are particular for um, these kind of uh, microbiology data sets, which we also don't have any tools that we'll be covering today for. And then spatial omics as well. Um, so now to cover what I will be talking about. So. Um, big picture, when we we're talking about proteomics data, the main types of proteomics data that we encounter either are these labeled proteomics data sets, and that's when you've got basically these plates where they put a bunch of proteomic samples on it at once and apply labels. Um, labeled is very useful for identifying lots of things, so you get a lot more proteins out of it, but it requires very different processing and technology, which is why I'm bringing it up. And then we have our label free where they don't include the data on these labels um, on these plates. And so of the two, you'll hear the terms bottom up and top down quite a bit. Um, when we're talking about bottom up proteomics, we're talking about when they have these large protein structures, they'll digest them typically with pepsin, pepsid, pepsid beforehand. And then um, intact, you're gonna get the full protein in it. When I'm talking about metabolomics, there's quite a few options. Um, GCMS, I think, was the, the first technology to really start tackling metabolomics, but um, LCMSMS is one that is a burgeoning technology where they run through these metabolites once, 
for the first mass spectrum, they select the really high fragments, and then they run it again, which is why it's called MSMS, because they do that twice. Um, NMR you have uh, is advantageous because you actually get um, abundance values in NMR data where you don't get that with GCMS and LCMSMS. And what I mean by that is I mean an actual concentration amount that they fit. So the abundances in GCMS, LCMSMS, and FTMS are going to be relative abundances. For NMR, you can get actual concentrations. And then FTMS is an interesting uh, other data set where you don't tend to get actual identifications at the end of it. You get compound structures, which you might not always know what uh, metabolite that compound uh, formula is from. So if I gave you C6, H12, O6, good luck. That can be like, what, 30 different sugars. It's extremely useful, though, for understanding like carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling and phosphorus cycling in the soil. And so that one's very useful. You can actually get that information as opposed to when you do metabolomics where you only get a subset of metabolites and not as much information about the compounds that are in there. So other data types we do here, lipidomics, typically uh, measured with mass spec technologies. Um, transcriptomics here, we have Illumina and PAC bio data, which if you know about transcripts, it's about how much or how long the transcript is for those two technologies. And then uh, MALDI MS, which we've talked about a little bit before, um, that data can also be used to do like 3D mass spec imaging. So I have made up a pipeline. And I use this made up pipeline to help me understand where tools fit kind of along the way and what I mean when I talk about a bulk omics pipeline. So I just went over a bunch of different instruments and a bunch of different omics, and I just threw at you a whole bunch of rules about how they change and how they're different. And so a goal of the kind of tools we develop is to capture all that information for you so that when you do analyses, you don't need to worry about remembering every one of those details will guard against incorrect choices. And that's what the advantage of a lot of the platforms and tools I've built here is that we help people make correct decisions. So in this pipeline, I typically think of it as the data comes off the instrument and then we do the identification piece and following identification. Um, annotation is a word that uh, Maria used to describe the identification step as well, but I tend to think of it as that quality check. So in Maria's slide, you'll notice she labeled it as a quality check. An annotation in my head is something that the tool has spit out, but someone has validated. For some data sets like metabolomics, where you get a lot less metabolites, it's reasonable to check them all by hand. For those labeled proteomics, you get quarter million. You're not going to be doing this annotation step. You're going to be leaving that for the downstream statistics. A lot of people, too, want to explore their data just in general. That's kind of just a, a key term. There's a lot of um, different data sets where we don't have tools, uh, GUIs or graphical user interfaces to do exploration, um, oh, beyond exploration. So that's a step there. And then from there, we tend to do the statistics. And right here is when we switch from single samples to multiple samples, because to do statistics, you're going to need more than one sample. Here's when I've got my comparison, a drought soil condition, a wet soil condition, and I want to compare which things are different between the two. And maybe from there, I have that data from a proteomics data set and a lipidomics data set and a metabolomics, and I want to put those together. And that's the uh, integration piece. And then an area that's always being developed is that interpretation um, part at the end, which is bringing it all the way back to the biology. Sometimes in that statistics phase, you maybe want to do some um, machine learning models to understand which biomolecules belong to which sample, or you've got a response that is a curve and you want to fit the curve, et cetera. So here I've got, let me see if I can get the pointer to work here. So here's a really long pipeline. You notice every single one of these is a different tool as you move along. So let's say I have this experiment where I want to do um, some label-free top-down proteomics. My first step is identification. So I can use one of many tools. Here's just two I've highlighted to get these long protein structures. And let's say out of these long protein structures, the tool identified some, they're kind of weird. They have some weird scores. So maybe I'll use this tool to figure out a reasonable score threshold. And from there, I wanna explore those results in a separate tool like uh, Mode. 
from there, let's say I have two comparison groups and I want to then compare between the two, I can use this tool and a separate tool to integrate it maybe with some other omics data types, maybe some machine learning later. So to use a different tool, and maybe I'm interested in the end of understanding the proteoform abundances specifically. So I do some post hoc stuff to understand maybe in an epigenetic study, um, which ones are uh, different. So I'm gonna go through these tools and just say that like, depending on your question and your analysis, it's gonna look different every time, which steps you do, which steps you don't do, et cetera. So let's go through these. Identification tools. Most of these are command line interfaces, which means that there's not a GUI to use. You typically have to get it loaded up through your terminal or through the Windows PowerShell to do the analysis. And the first of these is for um, proteomics identification. And this is gonna be for bottom up. So these are digested peptides. Um, this paper was published in 2014 and it is currently a maintained tool by Bryson Givens. Um, it's a command line tool in Java and the, the point of it is just to identify these digested peptides for both uh, the labeled and the label-free data sets. It doesn't matter in this case, which of the two um, you use. And so for other data sets, let's say you've got long proteins, you can use this tool called uh, MS Pathfinder. It's part of the informed proteomics uh, suite. Uh, slightly confusingly, there's like two like data processing tools that you run before MS Pathfinder. But when I'm talking about MS Pathfinder, I'm talking about all three because I care at the end about the um, intact uh, proteomics identification. So this is also a command line interface tool uh, in C Sharp. If you have any collaborators here and you wanna run these tools, we can run them for you. They've also been implemented in this platform uh, here at Amsel called DMS2. So we have a actual small GUI you can use to, to launch these um, tools and use them. And this is a tool by uh, Matthew Monroe. I also have in here kind of statuses of each of these tools, whether I know someone's actively adding to it or just making sure it stays up to date with all the language changes that happen every six months. <laughs> David, yes. could uh, really quick, could you maybe go back to your pipeline? Before? Yes, of course. Um, so there is a question online that asked, does integration always have to come after statistics? Uh, it depends on your integration method. So you can also integrate after you normalize your data, I believe. Lisa built the tool, so. <laughs> uh, it doesn't stick. Okay, I'll try not to move. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Is there any other questions before I continue? Great. So when we uh, are talking about now our identification for labeled proteomics, what typically happens is they assign these masses for each of those proteins on the plate, and then they combine that information with the identification, depending on whether it is top down or bottom up. So for bottom up, we would use MSGF plus, and for top down, we'd use MS Pathfinder. And we would take that matrix of information, and then we would take the actual protein identifications to put those together to get the abundances. And so MASIC is a really good tool for getting the actual abundances of um, different masses on, on these plates. And so this is also a command line interface tool, um, and it is in development. It's very much like a tour. If you look to your left, you'll see Marilyn Monroe's old house, you know. So now if you look to your left, um, we're going to cover just one of these tools that I mentioned that puts the, this information together that I, I mentioned before. This is an R processing package called MSNID and Plex Piper. It takes that Plex information, each of those plates with each of the abundances, and it takes the identification information and it puts it together for you. And so that's very useful to know that that exists. It also has some really nice FDR filtering built into the tool for false discovery rates in cases where you can use an actual peptide and you can reverse it. And when you reverse it, you can get hits that are incorrect, not real peptide structures. So they'll use that information for you to improve your identification results. So this itself is not an identification tool. Thus, we're already poking holes into this perfect design I want to build but it is useful for combining identification information and processing it further. So good luck out there. That's why there's experts in these things because I track this information so you don't have to. 
you could just tell me what you want to do and I can suggest these, these sorts of tools. Top picker is another one that processes output from a, a specific identification tool. In this case, top pick is a tool that does top down proteomics identification. And so this is a specific R package built on top of that to collapse typically redundant proteoform identifications. So there's a lot of push in proteomics now to understand proteoforms themselves because they have lots of roles in regulating gene expression and um, binding of, of compounds, et cetera. And so there's been a, a push to build tools like this that can actually help you clean up your proteoform identification. So this is a pretty neat tool um, to do it built by this team of lovely people. Vlad James uh, Moe, who just recently left us, I'm sorry, and um, uh, Evan Martin, so. Now, I've just gone through proteomics and kind of thrown at you that we've got things going on with labeled data and unlabeled data and peptides and longer peptide fragments or full proteins. Now we're going to switch entirely to core MS. And this is a nice one because it does metabolomics identification for multiple uh, mass spec technologies at once. So you don't need to necessarily track which proteomics data type you're doing here or which version. Um, here you can just know that there is a pipeline for you for each of these uh, metabolomics data sets. And so um, this is nice too because it's a Python library and a GUI. So you can have access to both of these. The GUI is up and running. Contact Jerry at this tool. I don't know if the status is perfectly, but I know an initial uh, version has been released. It's under continued development. All these people are very helpful and nice. And we love it when you use our tools and ask a question. It actually makes my day. So please send me an email, put up a GitHub issue request. I'll never be mad if you're like, I want this feature and your tool doesn't have it. I'll be like, great, that's my job. I enjoy doing it. I love my job. So it's fine if you make me work. Oh, did it go to the end? Oh, good. Glad I didn't break it. And of course, here's just some other identification tools. Uh, some of these are just used at EMSL but not maintained here. Metabolite detector and MS dial are uh, really popular metabolomics tools. I believe they don't, they aren't designed like um, core MS to handle multiple different types of mass spec data. I believe there's only specific ones they operate with. I want to say GCMS and LCMS MS. Uh, lipidomics uh, liquid has been developed here at EMSL. If you're interested in learning more, Kristen Burnham Johnson is a good contact for you. And then MS Dial also handles lipidomics data as well as MZ Mine. And then I brought up some of these, but there's actually like 30 different um, top down proteomics identification tools that are very popular these days that have different results depending on which one you use. So part of the things I'm interested in is comparing each of these tools, the assumptions they make when they do identification and what, what the changes could be, you know? in all my free time. So are there any questions on identification tools and um, some of the reasons why we run them and why we have so many different kinds? Perfect, I'll move on to annotation. So here in the annotation step, we're interested in refining um, our identification results. So you might've noticed I mentioned NMR, didn't say anything about NMR. Well, sometimes, the annotation step isn't really needed or you can do it in real time. So there's this really awesome tool. Uh, Javi's one of your, your uh, program leads if you wanna just go talk to him at any time. Natalie's right there, I'm gonna call her out. Anyways, so uh, this tool is super awesome. It allows you to do that abundance scaling in real time so you can get the actual concentrations of the metabolites. It does require you have some understanding of the chemistry, but if you know how to fit these curves, it saves it. It updates it. And then when you go to use this tool in the future, future, we've stored all of these results for you elsewhere. So it can pull in and autofill information for you. So this is a very unique tool because the more you use it, the better it gets. So if you ever are interested in getting the actual abundances, NMR is the technology for you. This is also a GUI and an R package. You don't need to use the graphical user interface if you don't want to. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice and it has a lot of um, great features uh, in it. So this is cool because you both do the identification and the annotation piece, the double checking that it's actually real in there at the same time. For proteomics data, regardless of whether it's been labeled or not, top down or bottom up, we do have this tool called P-Spectre, which allows you to real time see 
where all of the peptide identifications are. So the advantage of using LCMSMS is that you get both an MS1 and an MS2 spectra. And so the MS2 spectra, you can actually get lots of fragments for peptides, including the original peptide, which is that M, and then an isotope, which is that M plus one. And all of these map back to every supported region of your peptide. If you're a statistician, you might be terrified to see that this is a good match and we are missing so many peptide <laughs> identifications. So that just goes to show that the technologies are always growing and advancing, and there's always room for improvement in all of these technologies. And it also goes to show why things like false discovery rate filtering are important. Why having these reverse pe peptides and removing those bad cases and calculating a, a false discovery rate curve is important. So a lot of people use P-Spectre to kind of determine a score threshold for their data. So it'll rank all of your peptide identifications from the best to the worst. And typically you use some discretion to figure out where you want to draw that line. In cases of the labeled proteomics data, they have so many, they look at my tool and they go, hm, I don't wanna, seems like too much work. And I think that's fair and valid. It's just here for you to have that extra sanity check. My favorite feature about it is that you can add any peptide you're interested in. So if you run two different tools, and you get some different results, you can actually compare in here and get the actual fragmentation evidence for either of them to say like this proteoform is more likely to be there than that proteoform based on the data we actually have. So you can draw some firmer conclusions about your identifications. Oh, I'm gonna call it someone else. This is also a program lead, Lisa Bramer, and she's right there <laughs> if you have any questions. Um, I also mentioned briefly um, MALDI MS data, which is our ability to get into um, the tissue mapping of images and uh, et cetera. But you can use MALDI MS for identification, and it includes labeled free proteomics, lipidomics, uh, peptide data sets. And this is a really nice R package because what it does is just takes whatever identification results from these different proteomics tools or metabolomics, it doesn't matter, uh, creates a molecular formula for you, calculates the isotope distribution, matches all of those and throws it in one of those telescope displays that um, Kelly mentioned earlier. So here's another way, depending on whether you use proteomics data for 3D mass spec or whatever, you want to visualize when they get to the, the actual nanopot step. They want the best identified um, peptides or lipids or metabolites. So this tool just helps you rank them and it's uh, omics agnostic. And so that's that's the advantage specifically for this one. And it's built specifically for, for MALDI data. So we're just kind of giving you a sampling of annotation and why we use it. If downstream technologies, like in this case, are expensive, you can filter out the bad cases or the less supported cases and focus on the most interesting things. For example, you're studying diabetes. You see that insulin's a good fit. Now, when they go to visualize insulin in a 3D scale, they're focusing on something that actually is there and they're sure is there. So annotation is important. <laughs> there are lots of other annotation tools out there. Metabolomics has AMDIS as well as CoreMS will allow you to do um, that annotation step. Um, and Skyline is this mega giant that wraps all these different omics with um, mass spec um, data allows you to see in real time the fits and the matches of the isotopes. Um, it is not free to my understanding. So any questions on annotation as I keep trucking along here on our tour? All right, great. So exploration, kind of a, a general term, but it, it's useful for things like the FPMS data. You're not gonna be able really to do downstream statistics and other stuff at this point because you don't have any identifications in there. You have molecular formulas, but you don't know what they are. But that doesn't mean you can't learn a lot about from the data. You can't learn about carbon cycling or the nitrogen cycling. It's very useful still. And so that's why I have this kind of stop point in the middle here where you can explore these data sets. And here we have multiple samples at once. So you're able to do some basic statistics and, and filtering and compare multiple samples in this really helpful tool. Um, here's some of our development team on it. Uh, it's currently in maintenance, and we have this multi-omics analysis portal, which you're going to hear a lot <laughs> over the coming weeks. And this is one of the tools that is getting put into this multi-omics analysis portal. So it should be really easy to use and to automatically pull your omic data into. So 
We also have an exploration tool called Mode, which generates telescope displays for you for omics data sets. So whether you're using metabolomics, uh, which includes the GCMS, LCMS, and the um, NMR data sets, you can visualize patterns in those here. You can also do it for any of the peptide data sets or any of the lipid data sets. Um, and this allows you to look at different features and facets uh, of the data, depending on your specific research question. So for example, I've got here, oh, we've got a bunch of different fold changes for a, a bunch of different groups here for this specific lipid for people interested in comparing. I'm sorry, this is probably not the best picture. I've got some better ones where we show the fold changes for like amino acids, for example, across several different samples through time. And you can see that the amino acids increase. And so this is useful for you looking at the finest scale, which is each of your specific uh, omic biomolecules. So for metabolomics, that's going to be each of the compounds of interest or each for proteomics, that could be each of the peptides of interest. And then also for larger groups of that data. So in metabolomics, I might group by functional groups or by which type it is, whether it's a sugar or a fat, et cetera, and then visualize patterns on that larger scale. And so that's where mode is super helpful when exploring multiple data sets is you can have these different scales that you look at, click what you want, modify your plot, click create telescope display, and then click download. And then you've got a standalone display that's an HTML that you can share with anyone based on any of the patterns that you wanna see. So this is really useful for exploration and maybe trying to cut back to that biological interpretation, which is the thing everyone really cares about at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a high level view of some of the exploration tools built mainly to explore your data, um, especially when you've got more than one sample. Okay, so I'm gonna move on here to statistics, integration, and these more downstream things that are probably more interesting to you at this point. Um, PayMart, our ultimate statistics application for multiple omics, all of them. <laughs> we do it for all the bulk omics, including transcriptomics and everything you've seen up to this point with the exception of FTMS because that is, um, has exploration in, in the Frida tool. So this one's really cool because it allows you to go through your transformations of your data so that you can account for the variability across instruments uh, and the normalization step and then the uh, downstream statistics. If you got peptide data, you can roll up to the protein level with appropriate methods and your entire statistical analysis to the last step, which you care about, which is which biomolecules are differentially expressed. These are just some bar charts of, of the changes of the two. It will guard against inappropriate choices all the way through. Um, one of my favorite features is for peptide and protein data, there are multiple ways you can normalize the data that are valid. So there's a statistical test and an algorithm that we run here that'll just tell you the optimum normalization to use where you don't introduce any statistical bias in your data. And then you click apply and you move on. So the entire point here is to help the users as much as possible run their analyses as quick as possible while also being um, accurate. At the very end, we got a magic little report that says all the steps that were done. So if anything weird happens, you can go to a statistician and we can either tell you here's something in the app we need to tweak, or here's some way we could be more clear about um, this application. This one also sits within this multi-omics analysis portal, which is a bunch of applications with the ability to filter these applications to suggest workflows similar to the ones that we're seeing here today. And then also the ability to export data between applications. So let's say you go to the normalization step and now you're interested in doing some machine learning. You can export the data and pull it in and all of those previous steps and everything you've done up to that point is saved and autofills in the new application. It makes very nice demos. Everyone always likes when it autofills and takes, <laughs> takes all the steps out of the way for you. So PMART is one in the uh, map application. Here's a pretty cool tool. This one's just uh, in our package, but it wraps a whole bunch of batch effect correction methods for proteomics data with this nice team uh, of people. And it can suggest an optimum um, batch effect correction method uh, for, for your proteomics data. So these are kinds of the things that we develop. Typically in the development cycle, you start with your analysis and you make discoveries about it. 
and then you make an R package or a Python library, and then you build a GUI on top of it. And here with this analysis portal, we're taking that next step up where then you integrate it into pipelines between tools with explanations and steps and, and things to help people with. So this one's in the R package phase. When it comes to integration, there's many methods wrapped up in IPMARC that I'm not going to cover right now, but here's one where we do a dimension reduction with two data sets. The negative is a lipidomics data set, and the protein is a proteomics data set that we integrated together to look for uh, co-occurring patterns. Um, this tool is also in the um, map portal, and um, we'll be publishing it sometime soon. Yeah, that's the statistic steps where we're looking for differences between uh, comparison groups and the integration when we're taking multiple data sets and, and putting them together. Um, any questions? Cool. Comes to machine learning tools, this is kind of a, a newer area we're developing, but it's the same um, approach that we build all our tools with is helping people make informed decisions. So this tool is useful whether you want to do classification with known groups, whether you want to do prediction on uh, like a regression scale with known groups, or if you just want to do unsupervised machine learning. We won't ask you direct questions about each of these steps. We will instead ask you about what you want to do, and then we will rank specific algorithms for you to use based on your analysis goal, and then allow you to make proper decisions for the, each of these algorithms. A lot of statistics require that you don't have any missing data. Something I haven't talked about to this point, but you'll learn a lot is proteomics and metabolomics have a ton of missingness across samples. So how do you handle that missingness? What's the proper way to do it so you don't make invalid models that are overfit or overtrained, as we mentioned before today? So this tool is just to help um, users make correct decisions. It's in development and will not be ready uh, this year, but hopefully next year it will be ready and we can get into a little bit more of how it works, but it's really cool. It's also an R package at the same time. Um, it's called Slope, or we also call it Expert Mentor, because the idea is to have a mentor along with you to ask questions to, and then it helps you with your um, statistical machine learning um, algorithm. So very useful. And that's all I know for machine learning models <laughs> out here and tools to help build you. So this is definitely uh, a growing area at this point. And then we can get to this kind of like also loose definition, which is interpretation, which is taking all of your statistics, taking your, your differences between groups after you've done this collection normalization and you're trying to get back at the biology. And this is also like the machine learning model steps and the integration step where a huge focus is right now in a growing area. A lot of um, things that we're researching and we're doing now will inform the decisions for these packages to eventually inform the decisions for these applications. So we're still discovering and learning stuff in this area, which is why specific tools look like, because you don't build a tool until you know all the details you need to build that tool. So it comes to interpretation tools. One that comes to mind is, is isoforma. This one allows you to look at the relative abundances of proteoforms to try and connect that back to uh, epigenetics and um, regulations there. So that's the only one I know right now. You see, little light, and those are areas that are growing. I would say that um, on day three with proteomics, we'll cover some more interpretation stuff that people tend to do, specifically with functional enrichment. Um, here, we're researching how traditional transcriptomics functional enrichment fits with all our different omics and all our different tools. Um, we never want to just run something without understanding how it works and whether the assumptions of that specific model or approach fit the kind of data you use. So whenever you do anything, even just fitting simple linear regression, always look and make sure that the assumptions of the model fit your data, and then you can Google how to fix each of those assumptions or use slope when it's ready. So uh, at this point, you might be thinking, that was a nice talk. Thanks, David. But that's a lot of information, and I'll never track that. That's fine. My job is to track it. Your job is to ask me when you don't know. That's fine. I signed up for it and I love it. Um, things like the multi-omics analysis portal are really useful to help guide users through it, but this is like a, a next level kind of approach we're building now and still figuring out how to do is how to give more power to the users as well. You'll notice in lots of other similar tools that I've mentioned, 
there might have a bunch of normalization methods in there, but they won't tell you one to use. So that's why we develop tools like PMART to suggest those kinds of analyses and what your next step should be so that you don't have to be scared. And so you can be confident when you're using these tools. So um, always remember to support your computational teams and projects. Computational tools are just like the mass spec instruments. They require maintenance, they require love, they require long-term plans. As you guys go out into the world and write proposals and change the world, just remember your computational teams and think about how to build your projects to build up all these computational tools to keep things going and developing, to connect things, to help users. Um, very successful projects here have that strong wet lab team and that strong dry lab team. And you typically have two good PIs focusing on, on these projects. And I think it's just good to remember that we're two sides of the same coin different universes, but it's still all research and we need each other. So I love engagement from users and it never bothers me when anyone says anything about my tools, it means people are using them. So please go to the GitHub issues page and tell me whenever you're unhappy. <laughs> so uh, we covered just one of the OMPIX pipelines and you can see how many tools there were along there. And I try my best to organize it for you in some logical fashion through each of those steps and where each of these tools fall. Not every tool cleanly fits underneath one of those steps. Sometimes they do two or more. Some people build tools that try to do all of these steps at once. They release it to users. Users are like, this is too much and I don't even know how to use this. So this kind of approach of, of tools for this specific purpose for each step, I think is, is very useful and a nice way to organize it. So you don't overwhelm users and you also give them the flexibility to change their pipeline depending on their question or analysis. Um, there are many more tools that could fit. And the only way people know about them is if you talk about them and present them and bug people endlessly about them and every opportunity you have, you mention them. That's what I do. And so <laughs> uh, if I didn't know about your tool, bug me, bother me, tell me. How, are, how else are we supposed to know? We, we all try our best, but the world of science has exploded and we Google the best we can. Um, special thank you to Kelly Stratton and Lisa Bramer. Compiling, analyzing, organizing this many tools and this much information is not a simple task. We have a running list of what tools we know about and where they fit in this pipeline just for communication purposes. And so this couldn't have been done without these two very special individuals who have been compiling this information for a long time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> So um, there is at least one question online. Um, so Alicia is wondering about the identification or annotation tools for LCMS MS. Mm -hmm. um, they have used GNPS, which is the Global Natural Product Social Develop developed at UC San Diego. Okay. I don't know. You may have to look this up later, but. Um, they're wondering if any, the, how the tools at development at PNNL are similar. Um, for example, if they're based on spectral matching algorithms. You can also answer via Discord later if that's, <laughs> if that's easier. Yeah, to my understanding, it is still a, a spectral matching algorithm. I think MS Pathfinder uh, occurs in two phases where they first match to the MS1 spectra, a bunch of candidates, and then they filter it down to the most likely candidate with the MS2 spectra, but they'll return multiple, which is something else P spectra users will, will use is they'll look at those two cases and, and pick their favorite um, scores work, but not always perfectly. And so um, that's something we do in statistics and lots of other analyses I've done with Javi and Lisa here has been on refining those scores for metabolomics and proteomics. For your specific tool, I don't know. I'll add it to my list. <laughs> yeah, we got a question over here. Oh, one sec, they're getting you the mic. Okay, uh, so just one question. I would like to know if there are tools that are, that you can use to show the relationship between, let's say, transcriptomics and proteomics data sets just in a quest to know the gene protein expression patterns. So do you have such tools? Um, using the abundances themselves to integrate? Mm -hmm. 
So I am not aware off the top of my head of anybody integrating transcriptomics and proteomics on the level we do it because in transcriptomics, you get actual counts of transcripts and in proteomics, you get relative abundances of proteins. So that would be a very difficult data set to integrate directly. However, maybe rolling it up to the functional level, understanding the shared functions between the two might be a better ticket. In terms of suggesting which functional enrichment to use for proteomics, I don't know yet. I'm currently researching that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. So I noticed for many of the tools, um, I mean, some of the tools are R packages, but they also have a shiny web application. So my question is, why would you go for one or the other one? Is it, is it something related to flexibility or just convenience? That's an excellent question. Depending on what I'm doing, I might use the GUI if it's faster. For example, PMART, you can just fly through the steps now with our very nice GUI. But sometimes you don't want to do the statistics at the end of it, but you definitely want to go through normalization. And so maybe I would export the data at that step, as I mentioned, and use it there. Or if I got to process a bunch of data sets at once this similar way, I might instead opt to code it myself and use the, the R package as well. So it's a great learning device because you can go through, and what we'll do on day three is we'll go through map through PMART first, and then we'll go through how to do it with the code. So you could see at the same time, the same steps happening. And you could see that in the package, we allow for more flexibility because the assumption is if you're coding it, you understand what you're doing a little bit better. But within the GUIs, we um, provide more suggestions and, and help along the way because you can do that inside the graphical user interface. So it's very helpful to have both. And at this point, whenever I've just made one, typically uh, they, they want the other. Uh, you generally want an R package or a Python library always. And then the GUIs may be optional depending on, on what you're doing or where the research is at. You don't want to build a GUI no one's going to use. Whereas R packages, you can take lots of analyses and put them together depending on your, your question. Um, I could, you could probably talk to Lisa Bramer about all the weird, different, strange analyses and questions you get all the time. You're never going to build a perfect GUI to do all of it always. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Anjali. Thanks for your presentation. My question was regarding, so let's say if we do this training for a week, get out of summer school, and we forget about some of the things. Who is the best resource? Also, how do you go about establishing collaborations? Like if we need help with running some of these data science tools for our project, do we write a proposal, reach out to somebody? Like what's the process for that? Yeah, so you should be provided these slides. You could find our names and our emails at any time, and you can reach out to those people. And if you don't hear from them, you could email again and CC me and just let me know that you've done it. Kelly, Kelly is the IRP lead uh, who does this. So Kelly Stratton, who you mentioned earlier, is the first person you should contact. Is that the right answer? Okay, that's the right answer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. 